We have at last come to the conclusion of Nintendo Power's fifth year, with Nintendo Power number 48 for May of 1993. Our cover game this issue is Batman Returns. The art is a photo of Michael Keaton as Batman, and not exactly a flattering one, put in front of some original art that definitely gets the Art Deco style of Burton's films and the animated series. In the letters column, the prompt this time was for alternate players' poll contest ideas. There are some silly ones here, like dogfighting in an SR-71 uh, Blackbird, which is a plane that wasn't designed for dogfighting, but there are some pretty good ideas here, too. Of particular note is a trip to a snowboarding championship with snowboarding lessons from one of the participants. The letter says the champ, the winner, but one of the participants would probably be better. A trip to WrestleMania, and an opportunity to visit the set of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Of those, I can definitely see the latter two happening, maybe the third one as well. We'll see. <clears throat> you start off the Super Nintendo titles with the first Super Nintendo title from Blizzard, at least of we've co- that we've covered thus far, from back when they were called Silicon and Synapse, the Lost Vikings. There are notes on techniques for navigating the game's puzzles and maps for a selection of the stages. Blizzard has always had the strength of being able to take an established genre and give it a layer of polish that it hadn't been given before. Polish and refinements, that is. Ultimately making their work one of the definitive works in that genre. They took the base-building RTS, as established by Westwood with Dune 2, and from that gave us the Warcraft and Starcraft series. They took the action RPG, as established by Enix, Falcom, Nintendo, and others, and combined it with the roguelike and created Diablo. And so on. The Lost Vikings is the first of those refinements that we'll be covering here. In this case, a refinement of Lemmings. The action-based puzzle game where you have to get a variety of characters with different abilities to an end goal. What Blizzard did here is they took the hordes of constantly marching Lemmings or soldiers, as was the case in King Arthur's world, and took all the verbs of those characters and combined them into three characters. There's Eric, who can sprint and platform. Olaf, who can block and boost characters with his shield, and Baliog, or however you pronounce that, who can fight. The three of them, with all their verbs in combination, can solve any puzzle. It's just a matter of figuring out the right solution. This is not to say that the Lost Vikings is flawless. It has one glaring flaw that King Arthur's World and Lemmings didn't have, but this one does. You cannot scroll through the map at will, allowing you to plan your movements in advance. What this does mean is that you have to use your characters in combination to scout, and frankly this causes issues because those latter two games were much better at managing what information was available to the player than The Lost Vikings is. The Lost Vikings, you could very easily lose a character who you need to complete the, the puzzle while trying to navigate the puzzle because you run into a hazard that you didn't know was there beforehand, or that they couldn't handle. And you should still play The Lost Vikings. It's an excellent game, but just keep that in mind when you play it. We have another round of SNES sports titles here, and this article is more analytic and more willing to be critical, with several titles being openly panned by the writers. So I'm actually going to cover some of the titles this time, rather than just glossing over it because it doesn't give us any information about what makes the games different. The games covered include Super NBA Basketball and... Magic Johnson's Super Slam Dunk on the basketball side, with Magic Johnson's game being panned. We have American Gladiators, Test Drive 2, and Battleground Grand Prix in TV Sports, Auto Racing, and Formula One Racing in general. And on the football side of things, we have Super High Impact Football, Football Fury, and NFL Football, with the last two NFL football titles getting panned. So, the amount of coverage we have here, I'm going to review one game per sport, focusing on titles that were not panned by Nintendo Power. First up is Super NBA Basketball, and as I've mentioned before, I am notoriously bad at video basketball games to such a degree that I am generally worse at video game basketball than I am at physical basketball, and in turn, I don't enjoy these kinds of games, at least when played against the computer. And Super NBA Basketball is no exception. That said, Super NBA Basketball is the most enjoyable of these that I've played, in part because of how simple the controls are. 
with only two major buttons on offense, while defense uses four buttons, but two of the same purpose, switching between players. This makes the game fairly simple to play. Your accuracy in taking shots is based as much on how well you can get free of defenders and the stats of your player as it does on timing your button presses. But this is where things run into issues. I had problems with figuring out how to get free of players without fouling your opponents, and fouls are a very real thing that exists in this game. You can pass between players and attempt to get free, but as everyone is using man defense, actually getting free from your opponents you can take that shot is incredibly difficult. Further, picking what player you want to pass to is pretty tricky, as the screen is cluttered enough that it's hard to tell while playing who you have highlighted. Finally, as I mentioned fouling, you will accidentally foul a lot. You will step backwards while you're at center court and trigger a backcourt penalty. When trying to wiggle around a defender, you'll end up shoving them without intending to do so, particularly since the size of the sprites and the camera perspective makes it difficult to tell how close you are to shoving. It really makes it clear how much NBA Jam really makes basketball on 16-bit consoles more playable by dropping the number of players on the screen from the full 5-on-5 experience and eliminating most of the fouls. American Gladiators is a game that I was not able to properly play because I was not able to find the controls for the game, at least not the version for the Super Nintendo. As with the show, you go through a series of events, each with their own unique rules, which put you up against the Gladiators, and your performance determines how many points you score. The problem is, is each game controls differently, and there's no way on the cart to view the controls, which means if you're buying this game used and loose, which you probably will, then you're out of luck. And I checked, no one's done a fact with the full controls of the game in it, nobody has posted a scan of the manual online with the controls in it, so there's no real way to easily look up the controls online, which is a bummer. Moving on to the Duel Test Drive 2. This is a game which puts you behind the wheel of some of the top supercars of the 90s and 80s, well, early 90s and late 80s, but this game is not fun. This game is a straightforward point-to-point -point road race, like OutRun, but with direct competition with the car of your choosing. That, on its own, would be just fine, and if this was all this game was, I'd appreciate it, and I'd enjoy it. Except that's not it. They added cops cops who will chase you, and only you down if you're speeding, and if they catch up with you, and they will catch up with you very quickly, they will pull you over, and you will lose this leg of the race, and there are cops on every leg. This is a goddamn shame, as the graphics are great, with the game being played in a first-person perspective that provides a good view of the track, plenty of information on your speed and RPMs on the engine if you're using um, manual transmission, even nice little visual touches like bugs splattering on the windscreen. The only thing, aside from less cops or easier to evade cops, that I want this game is some sort of indicator through road signs or something else to alert the player to an upcoming turn, but otherwise this game, were it not for the law enforcement or the fact that law enforcement only pulls you over, this game would otherwise have been perfect. And then there's Battle Grand Prix. Battle Grand Prix is terrible. There is a reason why racing games which do split-screen multiplayer use a behind-the-back perspective and top-and-bottom split-screen. Using that camera perspective makes sure that the player has plenty of information on where they are on the screen and for upcoming turns. For some reason, the designers of Battle Grand Prix had the idea of using vertical split-screen for the entire game, both the single-player and two-player modes. Again, vertical split-screen. This leads to several significant problems. First, this leads to turns that come up without warning because you can't see the turn because of how the camera perspective is placed. And this leads to situations where you need to pit, but you can't pit because you don't know when the pit lane is coming up because the camera has cut off the pit lane. I could see this working if this was an arcade game with an extra wide screen, as with Darius. I could even see this working now on a game that was optimized for 16x9 or wider televisions where basically you have two 4x3 screens or something similar. But as a game made for 4x3, 
CRT televisions, this graphical perspective not only doesn't work, but it takes what could have been an entertaining and enjoyable Formula One racing sim and turns it into an unplayable mess. Do not play this game. Super High Impact Football is a port of an arcade video game which is notable for having one button controls, by which I mean there's a stick and a single button that does everything. You would think this would make things really simple, but it's not the case. Ultimately, I found it really hard to select a player to pass to, hard to find the put the right power behind my punt when I ended down at ended up at fourth down in miles, and hard to navigate opposing players. Without a manual, I actually say that I find this game significantly too difficult to be entertaining, at least in single player. Next up is Shadowrun, another game adapted from a facet title, and as Pool as Radiance has not been featured in Nintendo Power as yet. This is the first featured console RPG that is directly placed on a, based on a tabletop RPG that has been covered here. The Mech Warrior game sort of works, but I don't believe the tabletop Mech Warrior RPG was out as yet. I could be wrong. The guide gives info on the interface and spells, along with maps of most of the areas through the end of the game, and notes on what you need to do. Shadowrun is almost what I want for in a console version of one of my favorite tabletop RPGs to of all time. It has the look and feel of the tabletop game down pat, or at least as much of the look and feel as Nintendo's censorship policies would permit. I don't know if Nintendo of America would let you get away with a side quest working with the York Underground to deal with the predations of some members of the Humanities Polity Club or the Alamos 20,000, for example. Where the game runs into problems is the interface. You move around the world with the D-pad, and then press the action button, which allows you to move around a cursor or, in certain situations, crosshairs, depending on whether you're in danger or not, through the environment to select a target, either to fire at or, if you're not in danger, to interact with. It's not particularly helpful in combat situations, as you end up taking cheap hits while trying to line up a shot, and it's not particularly helpful in handling puzzles, as the puzzles can get pretty pixel bitchy. It doesn't help that the cursor has some acceleration issues that can cause problems as well. If you hold it down for a length of time, it will pick up speed, presumably because you're trying to get across the entire screen. But that also means you end up overshooting the target. The thing is, the game came out after the NES mouse did, after we've got Mario Paint. So this was one of the earlier third-party games to give support for the NES mouse, and we will have games that will support the NES mouse later in terms of third-party titles. This would mitigate some of these issues, aside from the pixel bitching problems. You could say, interact, map the interact button to the L shoulder button and on the left mouse button, handle movement with the D-pad, and then handle moving the cursor with the mouse. It still isn't a perfect fix, it's people who don't have the mouse would sort into problems, but it would help some, and it would be another game that would take advantage of the NES mouse. Thus, in turn, encouraging more people to buy Mario Paint, because hey, there's, some, there's something else they can do with the mouse when they're not, you know, creating artwork. We now have the cover game, Batman Returns. This is a brawler loosely adapting the film. You have a rundown of the generic enemies and power-ups, along with maps of the first seven stages. Batman Returns is, frankly, a mostly competent brawler. It's balanced really well from a difficulty standpoint. It lets you use your bat gadgets as nicely to balance combat, whether you're using batarangs for crowd control or stunning enemies so you can get to them, or using the um, bat line to move around the environment a little more quickly. The problem is when the game tries to change things up from the semi-3D brawler stages, like Final Fight, to 2D brawler stages like Kung Fu. These don't control as well, in part because of issues with enemy variety, the size of the field of view, and how much damage some of the enemies take. Particularly enemies you have to jump to hit. Otherwise the game is fine, I'd call it slightly better in several respects than Final Fight, or at least the, the Super Nintendo version is. I'm split on whether I like Streets of Rage for the Genesis more, though. I'm leaning towards Streets of Rage. 
going back briefly to video game adaptations of facet titles, in Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Mech Warrior, and he learns a valuable lesson about heat management. Now, the ballots have been counted, and we have the winners of the 1992 Nestor Awards. Rather than doing a category-by-category -category breakdown, because we have a bunch of repeat winners, I'm going to do a title-by-title -title breakdown instead. Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, won big, taking the SNES Awards for Best Graphics and Sound, Challenge, and Best Hero for Link. Similarly, Super Mario Land 2 won the, uh, for the Game Boy in Best Graphics and Sound, Best Theme and Fun, Best Play Control, and Best Overall Game Boy Game. The Blue Bomber also put in a show good showing, with Mega Man 4 winning the NES Awards in the Graphics and Sound, Theme and Fun, and Play Control categories, and Best Overall NES Game. Mega Man 2 for the Game Boy won the Game Boy Award for the Best Challenge category as well. Dragon Warrior 4 won the category that I predicted it would win, winning the NES Award for Best Challenge. To the surprise of no one, Mario Paint wins Most Innovative. For Best Super Nintendo Sports Game, we also have NCAA Basketball winning. Eh. Finally, Street Fighter 2 wraps up the awards, taking home the Super Nintendo Awards for Best Theme and Fun, Best Play Control, Best Villain, and Best Overall. In classified information, we get a couple locations for the twin shot in Star Fox, along with a warp related to the black hole that takes you to the last level. We also get a code for five continues in Super Star Wars. In this installment of the Star Fox comic, the story actually ties in with the cheat in the classified information column, specifically the black hole warp. The Star Fox troop crew tries to talk Fox out of braving the black hole, mentioning that it killed Fox's father, but that just riles him up further, leading us learning from Falco the secret origins of Andros and Fox McCloud. We start off our Game Boy coverage with The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. The game is not out yet, so this is more advanced coverage, showing the new game mechanics along with more information about the world. As the game gets more extensive coverage in a later issue after it has come out, I will cover the game then, and I will cover this game. There has been a request that I talk about the DX version for the Game Boy Color, I will think about that. Next is the Game Boy version of Zen Intergalactic Ninja, which has full maps of the game. Zen Intergalactic Ninja for the Game Boy controls a bit like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles back in the sewers, but the sprites scale a little better, and more platforming. Now, the platforming is alright, it's not particularly hard, and the tough bits I ran into, like disappearing platforms, aren't placed over bottomless pits that will lead to death, so you have room to recover, which I appreciate. That said, jumps feel sluggish and floaty, and generally not very responsive. Additionally, the checkpointing in this game is rough especially checkpointing against bosses. It's better in a few respects than, Zen, than the NES Zen Intergalactic Ninja game, but that's damning with faint praise. This isn't a game I'd actively seek out. Next up is Ring Rage, a Game Boy wrestling game with a rundown of the wrestlers. I can't find much info on this game, so I can't say if it started its life as a licensed title or not. Fire Pro Wrestling The Saint. The game uses digitized strikes sprites to try and give the game a sense of character, but it never really works. The sprites just don't have that much character when viewed on the screen of a Game Boy, or even a Super Game Boy. Maybe this were a SNES title designed from the ground up as a 16-bit game, but not on the Game Boy. Additionally, the game's controls aren't much better than the controls for the WWF WrestleMania titles on the NES. A series of strikes, maybe a grapple if you manage to get close enough to the opponent, with advantage being determined by raw button mashing. This is itself an issue, because the fact of the matter is that you can never really button match faster than the computer. Yes, the earlier opponents button mash slower, but when you start getting to higher difficulties, this becomes an issue. At least with the later Fire Pro games, things became all about timing. Now, the digitized sprites in this game make me suspect that this game wasn't licensed, but again, I still can't say for sure. Honestly, if you want to play a wrestling game for this era, go with the console titles like Fire Pro, import those, and play them on a Retron 5. Hell, there are a couple of Fire Pro games for the GBA that were released in English in the US that are absolutely worth checking out. 
This game, on the other hand, is not particularly worth your time. Next up is Great Greed, which continues the theme of games which want to have an environmental theme, but can't think of anything to do with it other than pollution is bad. This is a really simplistic RPG with some unfortunate implications in the localization, particularly with the names of countries and characters. Yes, I know the company they released is Japanese, but with your pandering to racist stereotypes to attempt to appeal to a Western market, it doesn't make the stereotypes any less racist. Great Greed feels like, much as with Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, that this is a game that is deliberately made in an attempt to make an RPG for beginners. The problem is, Great Greed is oversimplistic. It issues menus for using button inputs in combat. A attacks, B defends, and the D-pad handles spellcasting. Dungeons are exceptionally linear with no real room to explore. Further, the jokes aren't great. The puns don't fit with the environmental theme, which makes sense because the original Japanese game had a food theme, like Princess Tomato. So the attempts at humor and the general characterization of the worlds don't match with what they're trying to do. I'm not expecting deep world building in a joke game, but I expect the world to fit with the jokes you're trying to tell, both in the world and in the story. This is one of the things that the Lego movie got very right. All in all, I don't feel like this game respected my time or my intelligence. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips for the Super Nintendo version of Prince of Persia and for Equinox. Next, we have a major article covering the Super Mario Bros. movie and attempting to hype up the film. Consequently, all the interviews are favorable, and nothing in the article remotely hints at the film's incredibly troubled production. I strongly recommend you check out the Game Historian episode on the film. There will be a link in the show notes. Moving into NES titles, we have Kirby's Adventure, which makes for his first home console outing. The article talks about the power-up theft mechanic, along with maps of the first four stages. The easy thing to do is say this game is just that good, and to play it, but that wouldn't be good criticism. Instead, I will say that Kirby's Adventure is a perfectly tuned and designed platform. The levels have tremendous amounts of characters and charm with each world being truly distinctive. The power theft mechanic works into this beautifully by giving each of the characters powers that you can steal, and those characters with powers you can steal have unique character designs that you can tell at a glance. So you can know what they are, and what powers that you can steal, usually through them demonstrating them fairly early on. And consequently, characters who do not have powers you can steal tend to be visually distinctive and unique for each world and to fit with the theme of that world. So they give you something cute to look at, something that thematically meshes with the world that you're playing through, but also makes them recognizable as enemies that you can't steal powers from. The power theft mechanic also works really well, with each of the powers being useful in different ways, but all having their own weaknesses, but not with weaknesses that make them worthless. They're all perfectly balanced, with some powers being more useful in different environments than others. Honestly, this is one of the best platformers on the NES, and I can't recommend it enough. On the flip side of the coin, we have Incredible Cash Dummies. One of the few cases of a game going from the Game Boy version to the NES version. Though, this is a more conventional platformer, as opposed to the mini-game collection that the Game Boy version was. This game is utterly abysmal. The Game Boy minigame collection worked much better if the games were designed as a general series of concepts based around individual tests that the Crash Dummies would be performing. Instead, this is just a poorly designed platformer, which there are already a glut of terrible ones for the NES already. We don't need more of them, particularly this late in the console's lifetime. Last up for the NES is Super Turrican, an NES port with an Amiga action platformer. We have maps for the first stage of each area. So here's an interesting bit. Super Turrican for the NES never came out in the US. Featured Nintendo Power, but never came out here. It did, however, come out in Europe. I'm going to get clobbered by any European viewers I have, but frankly, Super Turrican, at least for the NES, I can't speak for the Super Nintendo or Amiga versions as yet, is crap. The controls are decent enough, A jumps, B shoots, the longer you hold down jump, the higher you go. That's fair enough. 
The problem is the field of view and when the game starts scrolling from one side to the other. The screen is basically divided up into three chunks, lined up with the left or right quarter of the screen and the central half. If you move into the left or right quarters, you'll start scrolling to the left or right. But if you're in the middle, no matter where you move in that middle half, the screen will not scroll. And what this leads to is tons of leaps of faith, cheap hits through enemy bullets or collisions with enemies, and questionable environmental deaths. I don't know why the developers made the decisions they did, but they made them anyway, and I don't understand it. There are other issues with Sprite Fricker, but because I'm playing a game designed for PAL on a display that isn't, I'll cut the game some slack there. Still, everything I hear from European critics, from Kim uh, Justice to Larry to others, is that Super Turrican is absolutely beloved. But going from this title, this version at least, the game is absolute rubbish. Hopefully, the Super Nintendo version will be significantly better. In the top 20, Mario Kart is vying for second place on the Super Nintendo with Legend of Zelda. In the now playing column of note in the Ultra Rans is Kendo Rage for the Super Nintendo. Finally, in the Pack Watch column, of note of the upcoming titles are the Super Nintendo version of Alien 3, Final Fight 2, and Run Saber. I own Shadowrun. I like Shadowrun a lot, and of the console Shadowrun games. I'd say it has the strongest and most involving story. It has the right sense of atmosphere as far as nailing the atmosphere of the Shadowrun campaign setting. But the controls of the game make it really hard for me to recommend it as my pick of the issue, especially considering that this issue of Nintendo Power also features Kirby's Adventure. It also features uh, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, but again, we're going to be covering that in a later issue. Frankly, I'm picking Kirby's Adventure instead. It is an incredibly strong game. It is a wonderful Kirby title, a wonderful platformer, and honestly, one of the strongest games for the NES. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.